requesting Mr. Chandan Kaleya to initiate the uh, topic of the day. Uh, good evening and a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of Daksha Legal. The topic of today's speech is Gyanwapi Dispute, Truth and Restorative Justice. As you all know, the Gyanwapi Dispute is the most discussed and debated in recent times. To understand the truth and explain about the concept of restorative justice, Mr. Sai Deepak, Advocate Supreme Court, and also a well-known author has joined us and has agreed to speak on the topic. I extend a warm welcome to Mr. Sai Deepak on behalf of Daksha Legal. Mr. Sai Deepak, please take over and enlighten us about the topic. I hope I'm visible and audible, sir. Yes, sir. You are. You are. Okay. Thank you so much to Daksha Legal for uh, organizing this particular talk. Uh, I will think of this as an interactive session. So I will sp spell out my position on this particular issue to the best of my abilities on the basis of facts and uh, perhaps the legal position. And I'm sure that there are a lot of questions to be asked on this topic. So I will uh, open the, the session for questions from the audience uh, within about 20 minutes at best. Uh, Chandanji, how, how, how long is the session? What is the duration of the session, please? Absolutely no problem. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, um, as far as the Gyanwapi issue is concerned, obviously this represents um, perhaps a confluence of history and law, and I would dare say civilization to some extent or a significant extent. But uh, since this is primarily a legal forum, let me try and stick to the legal aspects first and then supplement it with the non-legal aspects or the extra legal aspects. Now the Places of Worship Act uh, most people are aware was uh, enacted in July 1991 under the Narsimha government. And obviously this was in the backdrop of the Ram Janabhumi case, which is evident from the provisions of the act itself. It's a short three page legislation, I think containing just about six provisions. And uh, what is important to note, I think perhaps for the purposes of this discussion are sections three, four and five. As far as section three is concerned, that is the provision of the act which bars the conversion of the nature of a particular place from one religion to another or one religious denomination to another. So this is not just with respect to an issue between two religions. It also includes a controversy perhaps between two denominations. Um, and there is a certain cutoff date that the act prescribes. I'll get into the nuts and bolts of it. As far as section four is concerned, or rather as far as section five is concerned, this particular provision specifically exempts the Ram Jarma Bhumi dispute from the scope of application of the POW Act or the Places of Worship Act of 1991. For the benefit of the audience and just so that I don't get these things wrong, let me just open the legislation itself um, so that the discussion has a greater sense of uh, specificity. Now, I think the crux of the matter as far as the Gyanwapi dispute is concerned, comes from section four. Now, um, I think it's important to try and distinguish the provisions, which is section three and section four, because three speaks of bar of conversion of places of worship, whereas four speaks of declaration as to the religious character of certain places of worship and bar of jurisdiction of courts. So section three, more or less seems to be the provision that most people are fixated on when they speak of the Places of Worship Act, and especially those who tend to have a position uh, which opposes the ongoing proceedings with respect to Gyanwati, because according to them, Section 3 bars the conversion of, a, of the nature of a particular place of worship, and therefore, whatever is being undertaken as far as the Gyanwati uh, structure is concerned, whether it's a mosque or a temple, I leave it for the court to decide. As a practicing Hindu and as someone who's a student of history, I see that as a temple, people are welcome to disagree with me. And therefore, section three only speaks of conversion of the nature of the place. So let's just take a look at section three. No person shall convert any place of worship of any religious denomination or any section thereof into a place of worship or a different section of the same religious denomination or of a different religious denomination or any section thereof. 
So as I said, this is not limited just to an intra uh, an interreligious dispute. It also applies to intra-religious disputes because it speaks of conversion from one denomination to another. Now take a look at section four, those who have the section in front of them or rather the act in front of them, I would request them to take a look at section four because there are a few cutoff dates here and there are a few exceptions here, both of which are relevant as far as the Gamwapi dispute is concerned. Section 2A, which contains the definition for this particular, contains the definitions clause of this act, uh, specifically speaks of the, the, time, the date from which the act commences. And it says that the act commences from the 11th day of July, 1991. Therefore, for all practical purposes, it could be said that insofar its application is concerned, the act shall be enforced from July 11, 1991. Now, how does that segue or sit with section four and its provisions? Let's take a look at it. It is here. So four one says, it is hereby declared that the religious character of a place of worship existing on the 15th day of August, 1947 shall continue to be the same as it existed on that day. So if one has to read the commencement provision with section four one, what it says is that the actual comments from the 11th of July, 1991, and under the act, the character of a particular place as it stood on the 15th of August, 1947 shall not be interfered with. And that shall be treated for all practical purposes as the religious character of that particular place, which is immutable. That is what 4.1 says. Now 4.2 says, if on the commencement of this act, any suit appeal or any other proceeding with respect to conversion of the religious character of any place existing on the 15th of August, 1947 is pending before any court, the same shall abate and there shall be no suit appeal, so on and so forth, which means with respect to any proceedings or claims against a particular place of worship, which says that this, this is not the original character and needs to be changed. If such a proceeding existed at the time of the coming into force of the act, which is 11th of July, 1991, then such a proceeding shall stand abated. And therefore there shall be no further legal proceeding insofar as even pending matters are concerned. Therefore, for all practical purposes, assuming for a, for, a, for a moment, if there was any pending claim before any court of this country, a district court or a high court or any other place, with respect to any particular place of worship, that proceeding for all practical purposes shall be rendered non-est. A party shall lose its right to continue to prosecute its case from the 11th of July, 1991 in accordance with section 4.2. But there is a proviso to section 4.2 provided that if any suit, appeal, or other proceeding instituted or filed on the ground that conversion has taken place in the religious character of any such place after the 15th day of August 1947 is pending on the commencement of this act, such suit, appeal, or other proceeding shall be disposed of in accordance with the provisions, uh, the provisions of subsection 1, which is to say that if the character has been interfered with after the 15th of August 1947, then section 4.1 shall again kick in, which is to say, spending on the commencement of that such suit or any other proceeding shall be disposed of in accordance with the provisions, which is to say that any attempt to change the character after the 15th of August 1947 shall be dealt with in accordance with section 4.1. Now, the, uh, the, the most critical provision for the purposes of Gyanwapi, in my opinion, would be section 4.3a, which says, Nothing contained in subsection one and subsection two shall apply to any place of worship. So subclause A says any place, any place of worship referred to in the set subsections, which is an ancient and historical monument or an archaeological site or remains covered by the ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains act or any other law for the time being in force. Now, the interpretation of this could be twofold. That is, if it happens to be a monument or an archaeological site, which is covered by what is known as the AMASR Act of 1958, then the bar under sections 4.1 and 4.2 shall not apply. And therefore, the question could be whether this also permits the change of character of such a place, or does it merely allow an archaeological exploration to be undertaken for the purposes of section 43a. This is 
the primary issue in question, according to me, insofar as the uh, Gyanwapi dispute is concerned, which means what is the practical implication of section 43A if it is presumed that that particular structure falls within or attracts the provisions of the Archaeology Act of 1958. 43B says any suit, appeal or other proceeding with respect to any other matter referred to in subsection 2, finally decided, settled or disposed of by a court, tribunal or, a, or any other th authority before the commencement of this act. Which means if a, if a particular legal proceeding has attained fruition or conclusion prior to July 11th, 1991, then the provisions of this act shall not apply to alter that particular outcome. Then the third exception is any dispute with respect to any such matter settled by parties amongst themselves before such commencement. So a settlement between two groups, so to speak, or two rival claimants with respect to a disputed structure, if it has been settled amicably between the parties prior to the 11th of July 1991, then the act shall not apply. The fourth exception is any conversion of any such place effected before such commencement by acquiescence. So it can't be a forcible conversion. It can't be an illegal conversion. If it happens to be a conversion, which has the effect of acquiescence under the law, which is to say that you have chosen to abandon that claim with the knowledge of the occupation of the other party, then for all practical purposes, if this has taken place before the 11th of July, 1991, then you cannot use this particular legislation to revive that particular dispute. Now, I would say for all practical purposes, the word acquiescence here as used in section 43D perhaps has the same meaning and the same legal import as adverse possession, which is you know that the other party is in possession of that particular piece of property. You have chosen not to agitate it either legally or let's say physically, so to speak, or by sending notices. And you've chosen to relinquish or abandon your claims with the knowledge that with this, your ability to revive that particular place, uh, that particular dispute or lay claim to it ceases to exist. With that knowledge, if you choose to abandon it, then that's the end of the matter. But the acquiescence has to take place prior to the 11th of July, 1991. The fifth exception is any conversion of such place effected before such commencement, which is not liable to be challenged in any court tribunal or any other or authority being barred by limitation under any law for the time being enforced. So the fifth exception is that if such um, conversion takes place and there is a legislation which prevents the dispute from being reopened on grounds of limitation, then even that shall apply to a uh, section or, or rather that particular exception shall apply. Now section five is relevant for a slightly different reason because during the course of prime time television debates or even in other places, I've seen a lot of people raise the argument that in the Ram Dharmabhumi verdict, the constitution bench of the Supreme Court, according to a few people, has given its stamp or seal of approval to the Places of Worship Act and has effectively protected that particular act from a constitutional challenge. And therefore, according to them, the possibility or even a discussion with respect to the repealment of this act is out of bounds. That seems to be the position. But section five, according to me, repels this argument on the face of it. Section five says, act not to apply to Ram Janamabhumi Babri Masjid. And then it goes on to say, nothing contained in this act, I repeat, nothing contained in this act shall apply to the place of place or place of worship commonly known as Ram Janabhumi uh, Babri Masjid, situated in Ayodhya in the state of Uttar Pradesh, and to any suit, appeal, or other proceeding relating to the set place or place of worship. Now, the reason why it says place or place of worship is obviously because if it happens to be a temple, it's a place of worship, but if it happens to be a mosque, then it's a place of congregation. It can't be treated as a place of worship. Now, if a particular legislation clearly says that it does not apply to a specific dispute between the parties and carves out a certain exception, then strictly speaking, a court of law has no occasion or reason to look into that particular legislation for the purposes of that particular dispute. Therefore, legally speaking, any discussion on the Places of Worship Act, which has been undertaken in the Ramjanabhumi verdict, according to me, 
is an irrelevant discussion from a legal perspective because it had no bearing to the fact in issue, no bearing to the title dispute in question before the court. Therefore, it has the character of obiter. It has the character of a passing remark, which is not binding, which does not have the force of law under Article 141. Uh, in this regard, I have written about two or three pieces. I'll just share the links to those pieces, and those interested may take a look at uh, the, the, the articles. Uh, because I have clearly shown the mistake committed by the Constitution bench in, in fact, uh, discussing the places of worship act in the context of the Ramjan Bhumi case. The legal mistake that the bench has committed was that uh, I think they proceeded on the basis that Justice Sharma, who was part of the division of the three judge bench of the Allahabad High Court, had apparently discussed the Places of Worship Act as part of his reasoning. And that particular paragraph of the Allahabad High Court judgment becomes the basis for the Supreme Court's discussion in the Ram Janabhumi case. So I went through the judgments of each of the three judges of the Allahabad High Court, and I found that Justice Sharma had not even discussed this particular issue. In fact, he was quoting a previous Supreme Court judgment in the context of, I think, uh, uh, the Syrian Jews case in, in Kerala. This was a previous judgment of the Supreme Court, another three judge bench case. And he had merely extracted those portions from the previous Supreme Court verdict as part of his reasoning without discussing the act in detail. And the Supreme Court erroneously treats the extracts from the previous judgment as Justice Sharma's observations, uses that as the reason to actually look into this particular legislation when in fact it's a factually incorrect position. So I'll just share that article and uh, perhaps uh, this may become clear. Uh, I'd written two pieces on this, one in the New Indian Express and the other in the uh, Open Magazine. And therefore, according to me, uh, this, discussion of the eight or 10 paragraphs that the Supreme Court spends on this particular subject is for all practical purposes, a superfluous discussion. So here's the link to the first article, which is from New Indian Express. And I had written a detailed piece further um, on the open magazine. I'll share that shortly. Now, in light of this short primer, what is the summary or what is the uh, broad position that I'm advocating? First, that if you wish to discuss the constitutionality, the legality, and the potential repealment of the Places of Worship Act, that discussion must be had without any reference to the Ram Dhanam Bhumi uh, verdict. Because as I said, that verdict has no place or its discussions on the act have no basis and have no relevance whatsoever. So that's the first thing. Second, it seems as if this particular legislation was passed in a hasty fashion, primarily in the context of the Ram Janabhumi movement. And perhaps with a supposedly noble intention to prevent such disputes from arising in the future or reaching the courts. Now, there are two serious problems with this approach. One, it's not a question of whether a particular party will ultimately succeed in proving its claim over a place, a disputed structure. But should a party not even have the right to agitate that and demonstrate its case and prove its claim before a court of law? Now, this, this issue with, uh, with respect to a religious structure, for all practical purposes, involves fundamental rights under 25, 26, and 29, according to me. And the court has clearly said that fundamental rights, it's well-settled law, are justiciable through Article 32, as well as through suits. Fundamental rights can be asserted and enforced through suits. That's one of the outcomes or let's say distilled findings of the Ram Janabhumi verdict itself. In such a situation, a party which wishes to exercise and assert its fundamental right with respect to a disputed structure, which, believe, which it believes is uh, its own religion's place of worship, how can that right be curtailed without giving reasons and without even giving them an opportunity to demonstrate the claim in a court of law? So most people assume that the repealment of the Places of Worship Act will immediately translate to all the claims being made by, let's say, owners of temple property or claimants of temple property, uh, 
immediately getting those places. So for instance, if I happen to be a Shaiva devotee, which I am, and if I have claims with respect to Kashi or Kapalishwar temple in Chennai, the repayment of the places of worship act does not mean that I will immediately have the right to take over or reclaim those particular places. I will still need to prove my case before a court of law. Unfortunately, so I don't think that should be the case in this country, given its history. But I would say, given that we have chosen to subscribe to a specific way of asserting and proving our claim, I'm still open to that particular solution. Therefore, I would at the very least need to prove my case, which would also mean, is there a case made out for adverse possession, peaceful adverse possession? Is there a case made out for some kind of appeasance within the meaning of this act or even outside of it? Therefore, a party for all practical purposes will be subject to the rigors of the law, which apply to any title dispute. And in the very same fashion that the Ram Bhumi case was carried forward and conducted, it would effectively translate to a similar uh, style of proceedings as far as other outstanding claims are concerned. Now you've taken away those rights in a very summary fashion. And I think if you go through the debates, I don't think the debates before the parliament went on beyond three days. And the better part of the discussion I think on the first two days was with respect to the specific list the act falls under, whether it falls under entry 97, which is the omnibus uh, entry under the central list or the union list, or does it fall under entry 27 of the concurrent list because it speaks of religious institutions, charitable endowments, so on and so forth. And then there were multiple questions raised by, I think, uh, representatives of the BJP, such as Mr. Balbir Punj, uh, Uma Bharti and others, specifically asking, uh, as to what is the basis of this particular legislation, what is the intended audience for this particular legislation, why was it being passed uh, with such haste, because one of the procedural arguments that was raised or objections that was raised as part of the parliamentary discussions was that the notice which was supposed to be given to all parties by the movers of the bill, which is the government, the period was not complied with and therefore for all practical purposes, the opposition was caught unawares when this legislation was placed before the parliament or whether the, when the bill was moved in the parliament. So these were certain outstanding objections. And uh, if I remember it right, members of the BJP even staged a walk out, uh, a walk out from uh, the proceedings. And ultimately the bill was uh, rammed in uh, without any discussion. Now, the interesting aspect is before this legislation was enacted, no survey to the best of my limited knowledge was undertaken by the government to understand the status of outstanding claims with respect to places of worship across the country. Because most people tend to reduce this entire issue only to Ayodhya, Kashi and Mathura. Now that Ayodhya is done, they think that the only two outstanding disputes are Kashi and Mathura. I would say that's a very North Indian centric way of looking at this particular issue because there are several disputes, similar disputes in Madhya Pradesh. There are similar, uh, several similar disputes in Goa, Gujarat, in the South, and all parts of the country. Conservative estimates say, at the very least, that there are about 35 to 40,000 such claims across the country. And this is not purely limited to Hindu versus Muslim uh, dispute for all practical purposes. It also extends to uh, certain existing churches, which have been built on the debris or after the desecration of certain temples. Uh, if you go to Chennai, because that was among the first places where the Portuguese colonizers set foot, you will find a good number of temples having been taken over and churches having been built on it. And as part of the Portuguese inquisition in the Konkan and Goa and other places, several temples were destroyed over which churches were built. So if somebody thinks that this is primarily a mandir versus masjid dispute, no, there's a serious problem there. History says otherwise. It goes much, much beyond that. Now, in my opinion, the legislation stands in the way of a party's ability to assert its basic fundamental rights over a place of worship that has belonged to it for millennia. And it therefore comes in the way of what I call restorative justice. Retributive justice would mean that you destroy the place and do not let the other community even have another parcel of land as a replacement for structure which it has previously owned or constructed. Now, the Supreme Court, fortunately, in its uh, Ram Dhanabhumi verdict has, according to me, shown a decent way forward. One, I've said this perhaps to the disagreement of a lot of people in, in a previous session, that the Waqf owns a lot of property and 
a significant portion of the wax property comes from lands which belong to these occupied temple sites. Uh, I don't know how many people have visited Kanchipuram. So uh, if you go to the Kanchi Mutt, on the very same street, barely 20 feet away, you will find a specific, I think, uh, I think it's a mosque, which was previously the place owned by the Kanchi Mutt itself, where its chariot used to be present. And now that's under what I would say, occupation by another community. Now, therefore, there is a significant case to be made and at least a fairly arguable case to be made that a significant portion of the land owned by the Waqf across the country are lands taken from lands which previously belonged to temples. Okay, I found this on the web for as a replacement for a structure which it... Now, therefore, if the Supreme Court's solution in the Ram Janabhumi verdict is to be treated as a template for resolution of these disputes in an amicable fashion without everything languishing in courts for decades to come, then the alternative would be that the ones who are currently in occupation of these sites could perhaps construct a new place of prayer because it's not a place of worship, because that distinction was also struck by the Supreme Court in terms of what is the theological distinction between a temple and a mosque, one being a place of prayer where there is a consecration of an idol, so on and so forth, sorry, place of worship, and the other being a place of congregation and therefore primarily a place of assembly, not needing specific requirements or special requirements and almost any place can become a, a namaz ground, which we have seen these days. So therefore, given this solution, either the claimant community can offer land in other places so that an existing structure can be moved to another place and so that an ancient structure can be revived because under Hindu law, once a temple, always a temple, unless and until desecration, so to speak, happens in a manner which is consistent with Hindu practices. Now, during the course of my arguments in the Sabarimala case, in fact, Justice Deepak Mishra was the one to educate me on how a particular temple winds itself up to put it in company parlance. So typically what they do is that the murti is sunk in water to mark the uh, end of the presence of that particular form of energy in a particular place. In fact, there are adages in southern, uh, southern languages to this particular effect. Uh, I don't know how many Tamilians are present here, but the, the phrase that is used in Tamil is Talamurigarda, which is to say that you sink something or drown something head first. And when you do that, effectively, it marks the end of the particular place. So this is the procedure that's typically followed. So unless and until a temple is wound up in accordance with the, uh, the rules of, uh, let's say, Agama Shastra, so to speak, or whatever Shastra applies to a particular Sampradaya, the energy is believed to continue to exist there. And therefore, as long as that energy exists, the rights of the devotees or the followers of that particular Sampradaya continue to survive. That's the basic argument to be made as far as these places are concerned. Now, I'm sure I'm going to be asked this question, what is your position with respect to Taj Mahal? Do you think it's Tejo Mahalaya? Frankly speaking, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not willing to take a position because I haven't read enough on this particular structure. I have no idea whatsoever. But I might perhaps give a short um, response to perhaps this anticipated question. When the Ram Janabhumi dispute was being um, argued for the very first time in the court of public opinion in the late 80s and early 90s, in the immediate aftermath of the Shabano controversy, the first reaction of most people was to run it down and dismiss that particular claim as what they would call a fascist claim, a Hindutva fascist claim, so on and so forth. And as time passed by and as evidence continued to surface, especially after the excavation which was ordered by the Allahabad High Court, turns out that there was more than an element of truth in the claim made by the claimants of Ram Bhumi. Now, in light of that, and in light of the typical dismissive approach of the other side, especially the eminent historians of the other side, who chose not to step into the witness box, most of them. In fact, when the ones, I think there were three people who stepped, uh, who volunteered with affidavits during the course of Ram Bhumi. One was Mr. Arish Sharma and there were two other individuals, D and Jha, Arish Sharma, D and Jha, and one more gentleman or lady for that matter. When they were subjected to cross-examination, 
the judge who was examining these eminent historians and experts on the subject had to record the fact that they seemed shockingly and surprisingly unfamiliar with the very subject on which they claimed to be experts, to the extent that most of them had not even visited the place. Their own understanding of the primary resources was abysmal. In light of this track record, as far as I'm concerned, even in the case of extreme examples such as Taj Mahal, I'm willing to take an agnostic position, either this way or that way. I would want to wait. I want to wait for the evidence to emerge and see what happens. But as far as Kashi is concerned, but as far as Mathura is concerned, and having visited these places in person myself, I tend to take the very clear position that excavation was needed in the context of Ramdan Bhumi. Here, excavation is not even needed. Anybody who's gone to uh, Kutub Minar or any of these places, they can see exactly what has transpired in these places. Now, there is an alternative argument, I'm sure, that is bound to be made. I've seen quite a few articles in the scroll, the print, and other places where the argument that's been made, even in the Ramdhrabhumi case, is that of architectural reuse, which is to say that this was not, these are not structures which were built after desecration or destruction of an existing place of worship. Either there were earthquakes or the debris of an existing temple or a, a raised temple, so to speak, was used for reconstruction of the mosque. Now, I'm not sure this is a valid argument to make because I can understand if this argument is applied to one or two places, but if this argument is sought to be made across the country and there is no explanation as to how is it that about 40 to 50,000 temples across the country were in ruin, uh, let's say in ruinous condition, with whether they were raised, who did it, and all of that, if these questions are not answered, then the argument of architectural reuse seems like an afterthought. In fact, this argument of architectural reuse was introduced much, much later in the Ayodhya proceedings, because until then, the straight off approach was to dismiss the other side's claim completely, saying there was no temple there whatsoever, there is no such history, no destruction ever took place. Only after the excavation started, the position started shifting. And you can see this during the lifetime of the Ram Janabhumi dispute itself. So if anyone wishes to understand the ongoing controversy with respect to the Gyanwapi Mosque, all I would suggest is that you simply take a look at the shifting goalposts and shifting positions from the 80s to the 2000s with respect to Ayodhya. And then you'd ask yourself if the current positions are any different whatsoever. Now, insofar as Gyanwapi is concerned, and the specific well and the fountain that has been, uh, the so-called fountain that has been found, mysteriously, this so-called fountain happens to have the exact dimensions of the Gyanwapi as identified by John Princip, James Princip as part of his own uh, description of Kashi. The same eight by eight, uh, eight feet by eight feet dimension with a shivering at the center. So much so that in some literature, they've also said that uh, this is the exact well where the Brahmin used to effectively uh, dip into for the holy water and uh, share that with, uh, uh, with the devotees and would pocket money in return for this, uh, this holy water. Now, the location of this particular well seems to coincide with the location of the actual uh, Shivalingam, which has been described in historical sources, fairly modern sources. We are not even talking of Puranas. And then this also matches with the history of the reconstruction of the temple on the adjacent portion by Ahilya by Holkar, because the original idea was to purchase the property on which this well exists. But because the Nawab who owned this particular piece of land refused to part with the parcel of land, they had to build an alternative makeshift structure. The current shivling that you see in Kashi Vishwanath is meant to be what they call a Sanketika Vigraham, which is to say it is indicative, it is not the original which is, it is an ad hoc makeshift structure which has been built for the, uh, for the devotees pending the reclamation of the original Shivalingam, which is where, uh, which is the one uh, that is the so-called impugned fountain. Now, on the anvils of restorative justice, I genuinely believe that if restoration does not come at the expense of irreparable harm to another party, and has the consequence of satisfying long pending legitimate demands of the claimant party. And if it can be done 
in a peaceful fashion, in a manner in which there is already guidance to be found in the Ramdana Bhumi case, then it must be certainly embarked upon and put to bed for one good reason. As much as we may want to focus on developmental politics, as much as we, as, as we may want to believe that history has no relevance and that the past has no relevance as far as the present day issues are concerned, I think not a day goes by when history fails to make its presence felt. Every day is a day when we discuss history in one way or the other, either from the perspective of language or from the perspective of history, caste or whatnot. Therefore, I think to assume that these issues are merely legacy issues and are the pastime of the rich and the affluent, I would say is to be extremely dismissive of genuine concerns. Now, it's always possible for us to say that it's politicians who are raking this up. I'm sorry to say even that would be a serious um, glossing over of history. None of these political parties existed for the 400 years when people were praying outside the Ram Chabutra in Ayodhya for close to 450 years or 500 years. I think that's from 1583 or 1553. I think uh, since ever since Mir Baki destroyed the place under Babur's uh, instructions. So these are civilizational and legacy issues which are independent of any political parties or political organizations interest or incentive, merely because certain political parties see an incentive in taking part in these debates. It does not detract from or take away from the legitimate concerns of the ones who have, who have committed to these places purely out of their own belief in the, in the sanctity and sacredness of these places. So therefore, I think there is a decent argument to be made for reclamation. Now, people might say, don't you think that if the Places of Worship Act were to be repealed, it, it would open the floodgates for such litigation before the courts? I'm sorry to say, but the Supreme Court seems to be more than happy to take so much cognizance of a lot of temple-related issues on its own without even parties approaching it. So if such is the case, I think at the very least, parties who are interested in contesting it should be allowed their day in court and must prove or succeed or fail on the anvils of the evidence that they established or placed before a trial court. In any case, I think there is a long pending case to be made for some kind of a truth and reconciliation commission in this country, which hasn't happened. So you might as well treat this as an opportunity to address these issues by setting up of a different tribunal altogether or a different mechanism altogether to, de to deal with these aspects. Because this is not a straightforward case of plain and simple title property dispute. It's going to be a case where history, religion, and principles of property ownership come into play together. It's a confluence of all these aspects. So perhaps along with the repealment of the Places of Worship Act, to ensure that our conventional courts are not flooded with such complex litigation, which require, I think, specialist analysis and specialist approach, maybe they should consider replacing this with a different kind of dispute resolution mechanism. And I hope along with that, there is also a proposal placed for community mediation and community reconciliation on the same lines as carved out in section 4.3. That may perhaps even put an end to a lot of bad blood and acrimony in quite a few places. Because I would still like to believe that there are people who are interested in giving this place back and putting an end to this matter and moving on. Now, there's another sensitive and perhaps extremely delicate aspect of the matter. Uh, I might as well raise it. I'm bound to be asked if this particular line of inquiry starts and we go down this rabbit's hole. What stops the Buddhists from making a similar claim with respect to Hindu places of worship? One, the evolution of the Buddhist argument in relation to places of worship, if one were to track it, more or less was coextensive and coterminous with the Ramdhan Bhumi case, which is to say, around the period of the Ramdhan Bhumi controversy in the 90s is when a new school of scholarship came about, which is to say, in India, even prior to the arrival of Islamic invaders or the Christian colonizers, so to speak, Hindus and Buddhists and Jains were killing each other. They were destroying each other's places of worship. In fact, Hindus were doing this to other Hindus. And there are, there are fights even between Vaishnavites and Shaivites, so on and so forth. Now, there are serious problems with this argument because this argument effectively says, since everybody has done this in this country, why are we so particularly riled up about Islamic invasions or Christian colonization? Everybody has done this and therefore, a certain degree of normalization is sought to be made as far as this conduct is concerned. 
one the problem with that argument is it is true that even between vaishnavite and shaivite kings whenever they fought the places of worship of each other's territory or kingdom so to speak was the center of controversy but not to desecrate it but as to who shall own it and give it a pride of place there have been instances where the murti from one particular kingdom has been taken to another kingdom and has been given a pride of place not as an object of conquest but as an object of worship that's the first distinction when it comes to intra hindu uh, religious wars if at all they existed and there are multiple examples of this where they clearly show through stone inscriptions that these murtis were taken to a different kingdom and they were worshiped this has happened in the south second in so far as the buddhists and jains and uh, hindus are concerned if the places of worship act and its repealment opens the doors for every claimant nothing stops even the buddhists and the jains from establishing their case through courts but what is surprising is the so called buddhist claims and jain claims and i don't believe that this is across the board some people and some actors are being propped up conveniently these claims come about only when a hindu claim arises with respect to another structure until then there is no such claim made at all in other words before the ram janm bhumi case how many buddhist claim uh, claims existed which said that it was not a ram temple this was a temple dedicated to buddha and after the ram janm bhumi case or even during that particular period what kind of literature was placed to show that this was indeed a buddhist place prior to the construction of the ram temple so it seems to me that there is a certain degree of reluctance to back up that particular claim and take it to its logical conclusion a party which is serious about its claim and is not raising it as a vexatious claim merely to stall the other party's rights would prove its seriousness and commitment by continuing to prosecute that particular matter and placing evidence before the court and taking it to its logical conclusion whether through victory or defeat when that doesn't happen it seems as if somebody is a plant three um i think a few days ago i had this uh, uh, this running debate on twitter with another gentleman i don't wish to name the gentleman because i'm not interested in individuals i'm interested in issues who basically said kalhana's raja tarangini is a standing example of hindu kings having desecrated and destroyed buddhist viharas in kashmir and other places and to counter this or rather to support this again dn jha's article was cited and dn jha was one of the discredited historians as far as the ram janmabhoomi case is concerned that itself is an example of the pedigree of his scholarship so to speak this is not a personal comment but because somebody's eminence is being cited as authority i'm trying to say i'm sorry i don't believe in that three uh the tradition of this land as established and as proven through the popular example of what adi shankaracharya did was to debate and to dialogue and establish one's case through a dialogic process so to speak or what one would call in in the modern parlance the socratic approach so to speak so i don't think this was uh, this land has believed in the concept of conquest and destruction of other places of worship if had that been the case you will not find temples dedicated to grama devatas the so called non vedic gods you will not find temples being dedicated to the so called dravidian gods which apparently don't have any mention as far as the vedas are concerned or hindu scripture is concerned you will not find let's say the maitre religion continuing to exist in manipur or for that matter the religion of the nagas existed until the entry of christian missionaries in that part of the country and in fact how the naga identity itself was constructed there are multiple books on this particular subject anyways i won't get into that it's a different digression altogether so i'm trying to say that i don't think we must apply the example of the islamic invader retrospectively and said even prior to the entry of the islamic invader into this country this has been the situation all along that i think is a fairly broad and a blanket argument to make without any kind of basis every time somebody is pushed to the wall and said please show us exact details of this because archaeology is in our favor written scripture is in our favor records written by the chroniclers of these arab invaders and the muslim invaders themselves attest to what we are saying what is the proof that you have that a similar thing has happened with respect to a buddhist place of worship undertaken by a hindu king show that how much do we have and assuming for a moment that a buddhist party or a jain party ultimately succeeds i would go to the extent of saying that the party should benefit from its success and if i make the case that a hindu place of worship must be returned similarly a buddhist place of worship must also be returned but the argument that's being made is that 
Since Buddhists have been silent for all these centuries and they are not making a claim, why should Hindus make a claim? I don't think that's a logical argument to make at all. Just because somebody chooses to not assert their rights, what? how can that be an estoppel against me? If I have a particular right and I've been pursuing it for generations together, why should somebody else's reluctance, inertia, or lack of action be cited as a precedent to stop me from pursuing what I believe is legitimate? So I think these are strawman arguments. These are red herring arguments, which do not have any basis either in logic or law or even international practice. And since so many of us are, are I'd say, fans of jurisprudence from across uh, the other part of the world, which is say from both sides of the Atlantic, we constantly cite their uh, judgments. Well, it is from those jurisdictions, which are the colonizers' jurisdictions, where there is a talk of restorative justice, where there is a talk of facilitating reclamation, especially when it happens to be of indigenous communities, so-called aboriginal communities and native communities. Now, as far as this country is concerned, the native faith systems are what have been defined in the explanation to Article 25A, which is Hindu faith systems. The rest of them have their epicenter and foci outside this country. And critically, the other two faith systems certainly have an expansionist proselytizing component to them. And therefore, the desecration of indigenous places of worship is a consequence of that expansionist mindset. Now, Hagia Sophia is a, is a standing example, but that's a fight between two expansionist ideologies. Neither of them, according to me, is innocent as far as Hagia Sophia is concerned. So therefore, I think these are the broad arguments that one has to consider from a historical, from a jurisprudential, and a legal perspective. With this, I think I've said enough. I open this up for questions. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Any questions? Uh, participants can raise their hands if they have any questions so that we can uh, put it across to Mr. Sayadipa. So I think there is Mr. Rajendra's iPhone which wants to ask a question. Uh, I will unmute Mr. Rajendra. Mr. Rajendra, I can unmute now. Mr. Rajendra, you can unmute now. Uh, okay, I think Mr. Rajendra is Okay, Mr. Mr. Deepak, you can unmute now. So, uh, yeah. Hi, Deepak. Yes, please. Uh, earlier in the discussion, you spoke about uh, Justice Deepak Mishra's uh, thing where uh, how the temple is winding up, right? So will this be you know taken up with Ganvapi when it says, uh, since the shivling which has been found out was submerged in the water, will that <laughs> argument <laughs> <Come up. laughs> That's a very interesting question, but I don't think it was done by the Hindus. This was done by the people who were doing bazoo there. Okay. <laughs> so when someone performs a different kind of uh, uh, a ritual there, which is not meant to wind up that particular temple, but which is an act of desecration from a Hindu perspective, because if it happens to be my place and somebody performs bazoo there, it's a desecration of the Shivalinga there. That will not satisfy the requirements of winding up the temple, sir. Although it's an interesting argument to make, it would be a flawed argument, according to me. Uh, Rishikesh Dathora, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. As this reclamation of uh, temples is a civilizational issue, can we claim our country claim our temples on the base of history and the references like orders of Aurangzeb? If somebody else has understood the question, can they repeat it for me? Uh, can you repeat, Mr. Rishikesh? Mr. 
Mr. Rishikesh, can you repeat your question? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. yes. As these uh, issues are uh, civilizational issues, sir, can mm. we claim our temples on the base of history or the mentioned references in our books? Even I, after... Right, right. No, of course you can, but the point is your ability to prove it is subject to the removal or the repealment of the Places of Worship Act. The Places of Worship Act prevents you from even placing such material before a court to prove your case that this is indeed your place. Okay. So it's almost as if it's a legal barrier. The act basically says, I'm sure you have material. I'm sure you may even succeed, but I will not let you institute a suit for recovery of that particular piece of property. Because according to us, such claims should not come in the way of Bharat's brand of secularism. That is more or less the position that's been taken both in the act as well as in the manner in which the act has been given its seal of approval by the constitution bench of the Supreme Court. Interestingly, till date, I don't think anybody knows who is the actual author of the judgment in the Ayodhya case, because in most cases, in most judgments, you at least have the specific name mentioned of the individual who's authored it. Surely five people did not sit and write this particular judgment together. There must be one person who's authored it. We still don't know who wrote it though. But the person who's authored that particular judgment has taken the position that the Places of Worship Act somehow protects India's secularism and the Constitution's commitment to secularism. I find that an extremely vague and untenable argument to make. Mr. Jatin Sahagal, you can ask your question. You can unmute yourself. Sure. Uh, thanks for uh, this wonderful uh, talk, uh, Mr. Deepak. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. And congratulations on the second book. I have read the first book. It's it's, it's very good and very informative. Uh, so my limited question would be uh, if if uh, the, the legal points stand in the court of law and uh, the Supreme Court allows uh, or rather uh, admits that, yes, there's historical significance in what we see in Gyan Wapi is actually a shivling. What would be the logical uh, like conclusion for this? Like, would we be proceeding towards another Babri or uh, what? What do you like? What does the legal standpoint say that what what would be the next thing to do? See, frankly speaking, mm, as long as Section four three applies, just take a look at what is the consequence, the direct sequitur of the consequence of Section four three. Let's just take a look at it because I think uh, this is the central question. Nothing contained in subsection 1 and subsection 2 shall apply to any place of worship referred to in the said subsections, which is an ancient monument and historical monument or an archaeological site or remains covered under any other law for the time being enforced. Now, if it is to be treated as a monument or if it is to be treated as a historical monument or an archaeological site, uh, it would still mean that it is possible for, let's say, the ASI to take charge of that particular place. But I don't think that's going to put the matter to rest because people who are fighting for Kashi and Mathura are not fighting for the place to be treated as an ancient monument or a historical monument, but as a place of worship of a particular community. Okay. So I'll give you a very a clear example to uh, explain my position. So if you go to Mahabalipuram, uh, I'm sure you've seen all the Rathas uh, on, uh, on Mahabalipuram. This was supposed to be built by the Pallavas. Okay, I mean, if my memory is right and, and if my history is right. Now, the reason why this is treated as a monument is because the construction of those structures was stopped because of an ongoing war between Pallavas and another dynasty, according to me. And typically, a temple is completed when you... Uh, when you perform what is known as the, when the Kalasa or the, the sacred vessel is kept at the spire and then you consecrate it as a temple. Now, if you go to Mahabalipuram, you will notice that that is the only step that is left. And therefore, the ASI has chosen to treat that as a historical monument, which is open for tourism. In the process, if you go to that particular place, you will see people entering the place with footwear people sleeping next to the uh, Shiva in Anantashainam and taking selfies and pictures, people standing on the Shivalinga, regardless of the religion, Hindus, Muslims makes no difference. Everybody behaves that way in that particular place. They go and hug that particular Shivalinga and they take pictures with it. In fact, some of us have made the request that what stops the government from completing that particular one step and treating that as a temple when in fact it was meant to be a temple. So to draw a parallel with Kashi and Mathura, even if 4.3 gives you a basis 
to undertake this particular activity to ascertain the religious character of a particular place its original religious character cannot be reverted to as long as the act exists therefore if i were to be asked for a way forward i would basically say let the asi undertake an examination of all these disputed structures across the country put together a report on its findings make that report public and based on that let it actually make a case for the repealment of the places of worship act and as i suggested also combine that with the constitution of a new tribunal unless and until this is done for all practical purposes this will remain an academic exercise because even if you are certain the actual actual religious character of the particular place the act prevents you from converting its religious character unless and until there are certain exceptions so therefore the sequitur to this exercise would be that this should merely form the basis of an exploratory study to collect the material and the empirical evidence on the basis of which a white paper must be released on why the places of worship act is an anachronistic outdated anti constitutional and i would say anti civilizational piece of legislation which had no business being enacted in the first place that would be the way forward in my limited opinion uh dr arun kumar can you please unmute hi deepak namaste sir hello deepak i am dr arun kumar from doon university dharadu okay deepak i just wanted to know if there is any other solution to deal with the implications of this act if it is not uh, uh, you know uh, withdrawn by the parliament so if it is not withdrawn by the parliament then there are pending i think three petitions one by dr swami one by vishnu jain and one by ashwini upadhyay which are pending before the supreme court uh, which have challenged these legislations and um, uh, and if the supreme court comes to the conclusion that this legislation should not have been enacted in the first place because it's unconstitutional then that's one way of going about it but i don't think there is any sense to be made in waiting for the supreme court to take a particular decision um especially when that torturous route of litigation can be avoided and when the government has all the power within uh, within its within its power so to speak to withdraw this legislation after all what the legislature give it it can take it away so why can't they do it and uh, this is not a state legislation which falls under the state list as i explained this is under entry 27 this was conclusively established in fact the person who contradicted the bjp during the course of parliamentary debates on the places of worship act to prove that it's a legislation that falls under nt27 was mr chidambaram because then the argument was bjp basically said how can you pass this particular legislation how is it within the scope of your core competence and all of that and then mr chidambaram was the one to point out if i remember it right that nt27 deals with religious places charitable endowments and what not and therefore it falls under the concurrent list or other nt27 the concurrent list deals with all of this so therefore the center has the power to pass such a legislation was his specific position and i am basically using the very same argument to say therefore the legislature has the power to withdraw it so if the government does not muster the political will to repeal this particular piece of legislation then i have, i think ultimately uh, this goes back to the court and the court has to take a call adipak uh, is this power with the central government or with parliament no no sir ultimately this is with the government it's the executive that takes the decision to uh, repeal a legislation not the parliament the parliament may pass it but the prime mover is the government the government has the power to actually withdraw it can certainly see ultimately the government will have to bring, uh, place it before the parliament but the prime mover of the repealment also would be the government correct 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 absolutely right so deepak we are looking forward to you know visit our university i talked to you couple of times i hope yes, you remember sir. yes sir the thing right. is uh, the second book i i'm, I'm and the thing is i'm in the the final stages of it in fact i'm just finishing the last chapter and hopefully this will address quite a few issues which are ongoing and uh, after that the editing work will go on plus uh, even if i say so myself my practice commitments have i mean they have exploded so it's impossible for me to go out i'm being extremely choosy and selective i'm sorry to say i'm not sounding i'm not trying to sound pricey here after 11th of august once the book is out 
I will try and combine my book tour with these invitations and visits so that I'm able to do justice to both. That way, I think I'll be able to present the book in your university and also satisfy and accept your invitation. Okay, for sure. Thank you so much, Deepak. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Mr. Reke, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, Sai Deepak ji, I'm a very big fan. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, you answered actually my the question that I had to a certain extent when you were answering the previous questions. Uh, but if the government tomorrow decides to repeal the act on its own without, let's say, uh, a survey of any sort being carried out by the ASI or any such body, um, do you think it would have any substance because the government has shown that uh, uh, through CAA that uh, it has passed the law, but I mean, it's not really ratified or let's say it is not acted upon yet. And uh, also the farm laws which were passed, uh, they rolled back on it. So do you really think that this government has what it takes to do justice with, uh, with the Princess of Worship Act and the larger uh, point of control of temples also? Thank you. In light of the examples that you've given and the rhetorical nature of your question, I assume you know the answer to your question. <laughs> All I would say is from a legal perspective, a survey is not necessary before the government repeals the law. There is no such legal requirement. But why am I asking for that survey? Because I think it's time people know the real history of this country. And I would want that survey to be not just a prefatory step before the restoration of these places, but also the first step in setting right the historical imbalance in the manner in which history is understood in this country and the kind of grotesque distortion it's been subjected to. So my interest, as far as the survey is concerned, is threefold. One, it prepares the ground for repealment in a very substantive way. Two, it effectively will start a discussion on history, which is critical and crucial. Three, whenever somebody has this tendency to dismiss a Hindu claim to say, here's another bigoted claim, here's another fascist claim, here's another Hindu majority claim, when these stupid arguments are made, I think this mountain of evidence should fall on them like a ton of bricks. So my hope is that the survey is undertaken on a very serious basis. But on this point, please note what has happened yesterday. Some Muslim organizations have gone to the extent of even issuing diktats to their uh, devotees and their followers that please destroy Hindu motives inside your places of worship before any such survey is undertaken. According to me, an ordinance or some kind of a legislation must be immediately passed, which prevents anybody from interfering with existing places of worship in any manner, which has the effect of uh, desecrating them or which has the effect of uh, effacing them or vandalizing them to remove evidence. It must be there. Because if people have taken pride in retaining those Hindu architecture and continuing to treat that as a different community's place of prayer, so to speak, I would suggest that they continue with that until the exercise is done. Nobody must be allowed to interfere with this particular structure at this point. And that's exactly what is being done. In fact, some of them have even issued fatwa, so to speak, to say, please go ahead and remove those motives. I have to say that this is, first of all, super insensitive and dare I say even illegal at this point of time. But the stupidity of this particular suggestion is some of these places are so Hindu in every part that if you try to uh, efface them and deface them, so to speak, then the entire structure will collapse because there is nothing other than a Hindu structure in such places. I'll show you such places even in coastal Andhra, where proper temples have been converted into mosques and dargahs. Therefore, if they try and do that, they'll have to remove the pillars because the pillar, pillars themselves show that this is Hindu architecture all over the place. So I hope the government steps into the picture, passes strictures, and prevents anybody from changing the status quo before any decision is taken. Mr. Pawan, can you unmute and proceed with your question? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, Sai Deepak, sir. My name is Pawan. I'm a first year LLB student. Yes, please. Uh, my question is, uh, sir, uh, our constitution is supposedly the welfare of for the people. It's a, like a, a welfare constitution, they say. 
but why is it that when when there is a problem to hindus when there is a uh, regarding a temples claim for uh, like the fundamental rights of the hindus like uh, regarding worship why it is that the government or even the courts uh, even if it's clearly visible that the places are like hindu they hesitate and they don't even take an action also like uh, the place of worship act when it was enacted it's clearly uh, uh, in ultra bias with the uh, the fundamental rights why for so long nobody took an action and why is it that uh, being a hindu like in a, in the country where we the solely in the subcontinent we are the majority still we face such uh, dominant by the minorities and even the courts are like not uh, Uh, supporting towards us at the expense of some uh, of coming across as uh, marketing my book for that you should read my first book <laughs> it's, it's in the process sir actually so i have tried to explain the mentality there but let me pose a counterfactual and i think this will answer your question assume for a moment that a muslim body had made a claim that a temple was actually constructed after desecration of a mosque where there was no pre existing temple at all okay and if such a muslim organization had approached the courts challenging the places of worship act would the attitude of the media and all these intellectuals have been the same i don't think so the surprising part is not a single muslim body seems to be saying that we do have certain claims therefore the repealment of places of worship act is actually in our benefit and to our advantage doesn't that speak volumes of what exactly is the history of of this country see my point is this legislation is for all practical purposes religious neutral or religion neutral on the face of it although it impacts only the hindus primarily but assuming that this legislation stands in the way of every community's right to reclaim its its place of worship shouldn't everybody be welcoming its repealment now if someone says no no but other communities are not interested in reclaiming the places of worship all they are interested is only in development and science and progress and human rights and equality well what was the babri must dispute all about then i am sure that they were not fighting to construct a hospital there no party there was actually fighting to construct a hospital the expectation that a hospital must be built was ultimately foisted unilaterally only on one party which is the hindu party until then nobody was asking for a hospital so therefore it tells me that as far as this country is concerned there is no point in trying to convince everybody else it's the hindu community which must undergo a serious cleansing of its head and its psychology because it is buried under such amount of muck and uh, utter nonsense and serious misunderstanding of history altogether that there is no point in pointing fingers at anybody else i dare say this once the second book is out i confidently say this and i'm throwing the gauntlet at anybody who is who disagrees with my position this book will effectively show the origins of this mentality and how we have been constantly stifled and silenced to say please do not raise any questions with respect to your past and history because the moment you do that you you are the one who threatens the unity of this country and the integrity of this country and the secular fabric of this country so as long as the hindu keeps his mouth shut all is well but the day the hindu starts talking well all hell breaks loose that seems to be the sum and substance of the position next how many more questions are we going to take it's 720 we'll take this for another 10 minutes and wind it up yeah yeah mr gansham pandey can you please proceed with your question Uh, hello am i audible yes yeah uh, yeah pranam sir i am ganesha ram pandey i am a researcher by profession uh, so actually the last few questions were on the lines of what i was planning to ask uh, so it is related to the places of worship act 1991 only uh, so as you said that it will open flood gates so do you think that apart from abrogation are there any sections that can be used to our benefit to the benefit of a particular religion which has been uh, which which has been suppressed till now and the other question that i have uh, is related to what has been going around in the 
uh, in the social media that people are uh, trying to mock one religion after this Gyanwapi thing by posting pictures of uh, Baba Atomic Research Center and trying to trying to say that the that it is happening because of the elections and a particular party is trying to do this. So how do you plan to respond to that? And how do you suggest us to counter that particular perception? So uh, what was your first question, please? Uh, my first question was uh, related to the uh, Places of Worship Act 1991. So uh, I was asking if there are... Some... Right. See, I think Thank section 4.3 is the beneficial provision, which is what is being employed at this point. Okay. See, I think section 4.3 perhaps was left intentional in that way by Sri Narsim Rao to allow for a future exploration. Although I have serious disagreements with the manner in which this legislation was rammed through, I believe that there was a, a safety uh, valve, so to speak, that he kept uh, open in the legislation itself. And 4.3 is that particular safety valve. So the beneficial provisions, primary benefit and limited benefit is to allow you to what Justice Chandrachud has called ascertainment of religious character. So to that extent, it helps you. But once you have ascertained it, can you seek its reclamation that the legislation does not permit? So beyond that, I don't see a beneficial character except for exploration and identification. That's point number one. Point number two, this question about um, what is this? Oh, India is growing. The India story is booming. So why should we actually stop this and all that? I'm sorry to say these are arguments of convenience. If the shoe was on the other foot, I'm 100% sure that this wouldn't have been the reaction of the other side at all. I'm sorry if somebody thinks of me as a bigot or whatever labels that you may give, but for me, what, this uh, spade needs to be call, called a spade and there is no reason to beat around the bush. There is a very clear bias with respect to issues in which a Hindu party has the potential to succeed in proving its case. And Ram Jaram Bhumi was a stark and a crystal clear example of this mentality. Now, as far as our position is concerned, one, we may be a national minority, but we are, oh, sorry, national majority, but we are a minority in seven states. So when someone says you're the hyper majority or the super majority, why are you so scared? Well, I'm sorry to say thousand years of experience. There is a legitimate amount of civilizational vigilance that we must observe given what we've been through. That's one. Second, you may be a national majority, but you are a global minority. And therefore, you will start seeing articles in the usual suspects and in the usual platforms, such as the Washington Post, New York Times, and all these places in support of these so-called national minorities, which are global majorities. And the ones who happen to be perhaps the last surviving indigenous bastion and indigenous civilization, which has staved off any form of conversion and colonization, is the one that is at the receiving end of this kind of a behavior. Somehow that seems to be lost on these so-called liberals. So I don't think you should be affected by these arguments. You should actually have the courage of your conviction to respond to them in a language that they understand, but retaining civility and supporting your position with facts and evidence. Beyond that, there is nothing that you can do about the labels that people impute to you. You say what you have to. One last question by uh, Mr. Yaspasura. Seems to Basura, yes. please uh, proceed with your question. Uh, um, uh, good evening, Mr. Deepak. Good evening, sir. Uh, anyway, all my questions are uh, answered. Just to introduce myself, my name is S. Basavaraj, uh, senior advocate and the founder of Daksha Legal, who is uh, hosted this uh, seminar. Uh, Mr. Sai Deepak uh, has uh, spoken on behalf of for Daksha Legal on many occasions, including the article uh, <laughs> the, that was the, <laughs> the coins uh, the, uh, the sheer coincidence was that we arranged the meeting uh, in Bangalore seminar in meeting and it was postponed uh, for at least uh, two or three times and ultimately on a Friday uh, he gave an excellent speech and on Monday the bill was tabled <laughs> on the floor of the planet <laughs> parliament <laughs> everybody was asking whether Saidipak and yourself you were Privy to this uh, information, which even the uh, MP, Mr. Tejasri Surya, was supposed to attend, but he could not attend in the last minute. So they were asking whether you, both of you, are privy to the information. I said, I have no comments. So... <laughs> no, no, no. I, I claim so no I, important. I have no such knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> all my questions are answered. Uh, this is to request the audience to uh, 
join our website dakshalegal.com for more uh, information and uh, all my questions are answered and from the bottom of my uh, my heart i just wanted to thank my good friend mr sai deepak for the wonderful uh, lecture of uh, today thank you so much sir thank you so much for the opportunity yes sir yes sir okay uh, we will uh, stop the question at 7:30 now mr deepak is uh, busy i thank mr sai deepak on behalf of daksha legal for his enriching speech and explanation to the concept of restorative restorative justice it is always great to have mr sai deepak and understand his perfect perspective of law uh thank you mr deepak once again for uh, giving this wonderful speech and i also thank all the participants who made the session uh, a very interactive one thank you all we will join soon on some other concept or some other uh, point of law uh, mr baswaraj would uh, uh, has always been very kind and helpful in organizing these kind of sessions which will not only enrich the knowledge of uh, 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 every participant but will also put a new perspective as to how it can be looked into thank you mr deepak thank you to all participants thank you sir namaste namaste